Hello world, and welcome to the What is a Church series. This is the series where I go through the book of Acts and the letters to see what a church is supposed to be according to the Bible. I'm trying to do this without my preconceived ideas of a church as to see what the Bible teaches because many people claim to be doing things book of Acts and say others are not and sometimes these things are contradictory. So I want to see what the truth is. Uh, what I do is every week I go through some of Acts and I make notes. Those notes I publish on my blog and on my ministry site and the links will be down below and you can go and uh, see the notes if you want to see my raw notes there. Uh, what I do in the video is I try to explain uh, what I've put in my notes and why I put them in the notes and also try to put up a nice uh, idea of what a church is based on what we have there. Now during the last week I've read Acts 20, 21, 22 and 23. The reason is I'm speeding up a little bit with Acts now is because we're getting to the end of the book and a lot of this is mostly Paul's, um, the ending of Paul's ministry. So, what do we read? Um, we get the story of the travelers. And uh, Acts 19 ended with riots in, Ephe in Ephesus. And so um, the men start traveling around. Um, I won't go into too much of what's going on because there's a lot of traveling around. A uh, bit of a story of one place where they preach, young boy falls out the window, dies. Paul raises him to life. Um, in Miletus, though, he does call the, the Ephes, uh, Ephesians, the elders, uh, to meet him there, to talk to them. And there's some interesting things out of that. Um, they continue the journey. Um, they go to several places. One of them, again, is then uh, by visiting Philip the Evangelist. That's the man who started in Caesarea. And uh, Agabus, who we've seen before, a prophet shows up and prophesies that Paul's going to be captured. People try to urge him not to go. Paul says, I have to go. And so he goes, um, he visits James and the elders in Jerusalem and they try to uh, see if they can make a plan to keep Paul safe. Uh, Paul eventually does go to the temple and a uh, scene is caused as people try to um, harm him uh, and actually to hurt him and kill him. Uh, the tribune uh, functioning there at that point uh, hears about this and soldiers takes Paul away. Paul actually asks to speak to the crowds before they take him to the barracks. He does. The people get more angry and all Paul did is give his testimony. So the Tribune pulls him in. He actually wants to beat Paul, except Paul points out that he's a Roman citizen, so the Tribune can't beat him. And so uh, he just uh, locks him up for the night. And uh, the next day calls the uh, Jewish council to come and uh, the high priest and the Jewish council to come and talk to Paul. Um, some more conflict goes on. And eventually Paul uh, uses the fact that they're made out of uh, Pharisees and Sadducees who are not in agreement on all things. Uh, against them and so the tribune eventually not sure what to do um, decides to send him to Caesarea again to Felix the governor uh, and in between God also lets Paul know that he's got to go to Rome so a couple of interesting things I want to point out here is um, during this travel Paul goes to Greece and he wants to stay a long time but it's a short time because again when when um, Persecution breaks out, that's when they leave, and that's something I've said time and again, there's no in and out evangelism, the point is to stay, unless there is a very, unless it's for endangering your life that you leave. That's what we see the apostles do the whole time, uh, so, and when possible they do stay, remember they spent two years in Ephesus to preach to the people there, and to set up a church properly. We also see that these men, um, they do still celebrate the Jewish feasts, but the majority of them are Jewish men. So they do the Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, they go through the Days of Purification. They were actually on the way to Jerusalem during this whole travel for the Feast of Pentecost. Um, and the important thing is that, um, I've sort of noted this, is that the Jews are meant to follow the law, not the Gentiles. Acts 15 and 16 makes it very clear the Gentiles do not have to. The Jews are still doing this, and so that seems to be the pattern, um, which at this point I'm going to stand by. Um, and this becomes important later on because of Paul's accusation. It's what they accuse him of. Um, one of the inter interesting things is uh, when Paul raises uh, Eutychus, uh, one of the things is um, people say he's dead. Paul lays on him and then uh, he comes back to life. Um, it is possible, some people want to point this out, that the boy wasn't dead and the Paul just checked that he was alive. But still, he fell from three stories. Chances are, at the best case scenario, he's badly injured. Yet he still gets up and walks. So... At the worst case scenario, I'd say there's still a miracle of healing, but I do take the Bible at face value. When it says he was dead and Paul raised him, that's what happened. And uh, we'll just go with that. 
Um, what I find very interesting is Paul then does, uh, calls the Ephesian elders towards him and he starts talking to them. And I think he has some very important things. It gives us some insight into elders. Paul tells them that, listen, one of the things that you have to do as elders is you have to guard the flock. You have to protect them from false teachers who may even be amongst you. In other words, he was warning them that the, some of them could even fall. So um, this idea that some people have that uh, the guy in, front, in charge of the church, the pastor, is a holy man who can never fall is false. I mean, we've seen many, many leaders uh, fall away from the faith and then take people with them. So there is no guarantee that just because you're uh, the elder in a church or a pastor or whatever, that you can't fall. Guard yourself because you never know when it might be you. The other thing is there is a group of elders and the reason why there's always a group and I think the Antioch principle of five, at least five is a good one, is if one of them starts to become a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, the other four can stop him. And that's the idea is it, it's, it's a bit of accountability. Uh, there's no one man in charge. Um, I mean, churches where there's just one man and everyone just does what the pastor says, I don't think that's how it's meant to be. It's a group of men who are supposed to be at the top. That's what you see on and on. They always set up a group of men. And I've pointed this out before. Um, when the apostles are out there going, these evangelists travel in groups of two or more. That's how they've always traveled. Uh, there have only been two examples where they didn't, and that was Philip, but that was because of persecution, and they just had to flee, so he ended up on his own. The other one is Apollos, who did not know all of the gospel and had to be taught more. Um, other than that, we always see them in groups. There was a brief moment where Paul was alone, but as soon as, he could, as they could, Silas and Timothy joined him. Uh, we read that earlier as well. Something else Paul says to these men is, uh, he says, look, take note, I worked for my possessions. I did not take silver, gold or anything from you. I worked for it. And this is a principle I think that's also important for elders is um, you do not live off the church. Look, if a church wants to support a, an elder, that's up to them. It's their decision. I'm not going to get into that. But Paul makes it clear that you should actually work to eat. He does that um, He uh, in many places. We was seen when he was in Corinth, he was a tent maker, he was earning his own. Apparently he did the same thing in Ephesus because he says to them, you know, I worked to uh, provide for myself. And the funny thing is just this week, my wife was reading in 2 Thessalonians, where Paul gives the exact same thing saying, hey, you've got to work for yourself and not live off others. Um, even in that passage saying, if there are people uh, pretty much sponging off others, um, keep them out of your midst. Um, which is a pretty harsh one, but a very clear Paul says you work for it. And he says this to the elders as well. And as a leader, he showed that as well. So I believe as leaders, you should be still involved in your own job providing for yourself. And I think a very key point of why is I've seen men who get who are fully paid by the church and are so out of touch of society and how life works, um, they become useless in uh, actually helping people. And that's a danger if you're going to isolate yourself in that way. It's great to study God's word the whole time. Um, as a preacher, I do think if you can get some time to study uh, God's word and if the church says, look, we'll pay a part of a salary, that's great. But you should still be involved in society to provide for yourself, but to also understand what's going on and to see what's going on and to be amongst people and not to be high and lofted up and um, become the God of your little kingdom. Also, we see uh, something people like to point out. Uh, verse 35, Paul uh, quotes Jesus saying, it is blessed, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And if you um, Google search your Bible, you will not find that phrase anywhere in the red letters. So what is this? Well, you've got to remember the Gospels are pretty much the highlights of Jesus' ministry. And there are a lot of times where you'll read, and this, to me, sometimes these stories are like, really, did they three sentences handle this situation? What is going on is very often, and I do this a lot as well, is I will never tell you exactly everything my doctor tells me. But in my leukemia videos, I give you a rough overview of what's going on. And that's what the Gospels also are. So there are times where they will quote Jesus, literally, like he said, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount. But there are times you've got to understand that Jesus will have said a lot more than we read. So when Paul says Jesus said this, it's very likely he did. Just that none of the Gospel writers uh, put that down because it just wasn't within the context of what they were writing. So there's no contradiction or problem here. It's just some extra information Paul has that he gives. Um, when they get to Jerusalem, uh, just a bit of historical context. Um, people like to point out uh, when they want to do uh, one man in charge of everything is James was the head of the Jerusalem church and everyone was under James. It says very clear James and the elders. Now, I think what's going on here is 
When you have a group of people and one of them is more known than the others, you'll generally say Joe and the rest, you know, because everyone knows Joe and then they understand who the rest are. Uh, and same way James and the elders. James is one of the elders. And if James was a leader, which historically you can see that some form of that, but it's the same way Peter was in the beginning, the leader. But um, I think it's more of uh, when you have a group, generally someone tends to rise up and be the more outspoken, the more extroverted person will say more. So I th I'm willing to say that this leadership is the same as what Peter had in the beginning of Acts. It is more of the spokesperson, the person who speaks the most. Remember in Acts 15, when they were discussing what to do with the Gentiles, James is the one who eventually formulates the solution. That's after they all were together praying and thinking about this, James formulated it. And I think that's more the role rather than um, that James was the Pope of the Jerusalem church. Also in Jerusalem, they're trying to make plans to keep Paul safe. Now, the reason is apparently Paul's being accused of teaching that Jews are no longer supposed to live under the law. That's the accusation. Now, I've been saying Jews must live under the law or should. And uh, yeah, we see what happens is, is Paul preaching against it? Well, no, he's um, been circumcising Timothy, who had Jew a Jewish uh, parent. Um, and we see that when he comes, he, he still does Jewish vows. Uh, and what's one of the things they do is they make, put him through the uh, days of purification when he arrives uh, with a couple of men who are also doing a vow. And you see very clearly, Paul is still living under the law. Well, not under the law as in the law saves him, but he still obeys the law, but he lives under the grace of Jesus. And that's what he's trying to do with the Jews is that, that balance, while the Gentiles don't get the law. But a lot of the Jews misunderstood what he was saying, I think, and that's why that accusation comes. He is telling people not to live by the law anymore. It's not exactly what he's doing. It's the Gentiles. And it's very clear in this text, that's exactly what the elders in Jerusalem are also trying to do. Is they're trying to make sure, look, um, Paul, for, keep, keep following the law. It's what we normally do. Gentiles don't have to, but as Jews, we do. And that's something that we see time and again in context seems to be the case here. So what we can do is we can conclude that the accusations were false. Um, Paul lets himself still though be taken because we know God's calling him to Rome. But it's very clear that the Jews are still living living by the law, not being saved by the law, but living by the law. Gentiles do not have to because of the position. Remember, the old covenant, the law, the old covenant is God's covenant with the Jewish people. We as Gentiles, we have a new covenant with God. The Jews are also part of the new covenant because that's for all of mankind. And uh, one last thing I'd like to point out um, during this whole passage we read, when we're reading, we see Paul's a very intelligent man. Uh, he knows to speak Greek to the tribune, but uh, Aramaic to the people. We see he, um, when he's going to get flogged, he uses his Roman citizenship um, to stop them from doing that. We see that when he sees, hey, the Sadducees and Pharisees, um, he makes it a point of bringing up the resurrection to divert the discussion away from him, but onto other matters. And so much so that the Pharisees start saying, you know, we side with Paul, he's in the right, um, which is because it became a political situation. So Paul's a very intelligent man. He uses his citizenship. And I mentioned this last week. I think when you have something that God's given you, uh, you should use it, including things like uh, citizens of the United States have a very privileged position with their passport. They should use it for God's kingdom. And um, there are many other areas where God may have done it, whether it be finances, a position in a company or, or whatever. Use it for God's kingdom in a, in a very intelligent way. So that brings us to then the question, what is a church? And then we, uh, I like to give a summary at the end of these videos, um, which is usually pretty long because I'm building up quite a large uh, number of points on what a church is. But I'll try to get to them quickly for this one. Um, and I'll try to next week get Acts finished. I hope I can get those chapters all done. That way I can afterwards make a nice detailed summary video for you. But f to summarize for now, the church firstly e is all the believers of Jesus Christ, those dedicated to Jesus who are born again, who are saved, who have given their lives to Jesus. Uh, a church is also the group of local believers in a, in a certain area or region. And these are not to be confused with a building that some of these local believers go to that they call a church. So when we talk about a church, we are talking about either the body of Christ as its whole, or we're talking about a local group of believers in an area. I'm not talking about buildings. So what does a church do? We know they pray God, they pray, they worship, they uh, study the scriptures, they teach, they preach. 
Um, they have fellowship together. All those things, we've discussed them uh, many times. We know that they do those things. What do they not do? Um, we don't do in and out evangelism. Uh, when we're going to reach a place, we go and we establish ourselves and we take time to really teach people. Uh, so that the, you can set elders who can then carry on doing um, the discipleship. Also, uh, we I do not uh, stand behind healing crusades. What I mean by that is we do not advertise healing. We're there to preach the gospel, not uh, to do miracles. The miracles are a sign that the gospel is true and we should do them out of compassion for people. Um, but we should not go into a place with the idea, you know what, we're just going to go there and big healing crusade and try and advertise healing. This is not a marketing gimmick. This is just something we do out of compassion while we're preaching. Also, no one goes alone. It is not one man and his group. It is a group of people working together. And that's also what the elders of the church are. So there's not one man alone. Uh, traveling groups work together. And uh, that way you can also guard each other. And the other thing that we don't do is we don't force Gentiles to live by law. The Jews live by the law because it's God's covenant with them. But the Gentiles do not. We are in the new covenant and we have a different uh, rules we live by. Right, and then of course we have the positions in the church, and we've spoken about them before. We have the apostles, as in the original 12, or maybe more. I suppose more could be because the criteria was those who were with Jesus from the, his baptism till his resurrection. It means if you're 2,000 years old, you could be an apostle, otherwise not. We do have what we call evangelist apostles. Those are the men like Paul, Silas, Barnabas, Philip, who are going around preaching the gospel. You can be one of those, um, but you are not an apostle in the sense of the original 12 Jesus called. Those are a special position defined by Paul in Acts chapter 2. We also know that there are uh, within the church disciples. Those are the people, those are actually pretty much all the believers. Everyone's called to be a disciple. Um, and in how far you do that, uh, I'll leave that up to you. But we are all called to learn and to grow as disciples and to start doing that that we've seen those above us do. There are also ministers, those are the people who serve, and that is literally serve. A minister is not someone who stands up there and tells people what to do or who goes out there to preach and teach, but a minister is someone who literally serves. Um, we saw the original seven, while they did go over to preach like Philip became an evangelist, uh, they start off by being servers. They literally served the widows in the church. And we see Dorcas, who is also one who would make clothes for people and serve them. Those are ministers. We do also have elders, and those are the people who are set up in charge of the church, in the sense that they're there to guard the church, not to tell people what to do, but to guard the church and protect the church from false teachings. Also, guarding the church from if someone amongst them is a false teacher, and they are also a part of the church and are not supposed to live off the church. Um, I think part of being a wolf is you do not eat the flock, so you provide for yourself. And that's something we see Paul also makes a point of, he always did, to show them how to do that. And the elders, of course, uh, that we see in, uh, amongst them are uh, teachers and prophets. Teachers who teach the word, prophets who bring divine revelation. Well, that's all we have for this week. Uh, I hope you are enjoying the series with me. Um, and if you have any comments or questions, please do uh, leave them below. And I'll try to get to them and... Um, help out with that. Uh, I'm still, as I said, I'm still going through this. I've still got to get through the letters. I'm sure there's a lot more fine tuning we can do onto what is a church, but I think we've gotten a pretty interesting idea of this. Um, there'll be one or two more parts where we go through Acts and then uh, afterwards a summary part of what we learned in Acts. And then I'll have to have a look and see how exactly I will plan the letters uh, because um, I like to sort of start with a story time, uh, but letters aren't really <laughs> story time so i'm not sure how we can do that we'll have to have a look and see how we do that and how that takes form but i do hope you enjoy doing this with me and traveling through the bible with me as to uh, see what a church is and uh, if you have ideas of other things you'd also like to know or learn about that you think i'd be uh, interested in also looking at or studying you can also leave them down um, i do like to study all sorts of things uh, do let me know if you have any questions um, and uh, yeah just um, have a good day Keep well and God bless. It's September and September is Leukemia Awareness Month. 
So if you're not registered as a stem cell donor, please do consider doing so because you may save someone's life.